This is Beyond the Bell Tower, where an elite group of North Carolina State University students give us a behind-the-scenes look at their steps to success and show us how they attain even their lofty goals. These students, who are in the top 10% of the country, are active in student support services at NC State, a nationally recognized program designed to provide support for low-income, first-generation college students. Nationally, this population has an 11% graduation rate within six years. The Student Support Services students surpass that rate each year and go on to become doctors, dentists, accountants, and engineers. They work at Google, Apple, and the NCAA. They have earned PhDs in Ivy League colleges. These students go well beyond the bell tower to reach this level of success. You welcome to Beyond the Bell Tower. We're here with Jesse Lopez. He actually was in TRIO in high school, yep. an upward bound, and now he is a research fellow is that I'm a, your term? I'm um, an NCSU Libraries Fellow. A Libraries Fellow, um, and you've been here for two years? A little under. I little got under. here in July of 2016. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're actually going to talk today to learn how he got from Los Angeles, California to become a librarian scientist. <laughs> this might be a really long conversation. <laughs> I might, I might need a drink. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's what's um, really cool today is that uh, Jesse has the history in TRIO and um, has a very, you know, interesting and unique story because not many people grow up wanting to be in library science yeah, or be uh, in a librarian. Neither did I. It <laughs> yeah. just it sort of happened this way. Yeah. But so do you want to— have reasonings. Yeah, so what yeah. are your reasons? What is your— well, so let's start in high school when yeah, you got sure. into TRIO. Like, what were you like? What was going on for you? Um, so uh, I was a first-generation um, college student, mm -hmm. like many of you that are listening right now, or like all of you, I imagine, mm -hmm. that are listening right now. Um, I'm from Los Angeles, California, in like this area called San Gabriel Valley, which is, uh, or was, not so much anymore, but it's very, was a very blue-collar place. Um and my school wasn't like the best school, and so like I ended up getting uh, placed or like I applied for and got into uh, Harvey Mudd colleges, like the Claremont colleges, Upward Bound, um, when I was at the end of my freshman year. Mm -hmm. So they did the whole um, freshman residential program at Harvey Mudd at the Claremont colleges, and then the second summer for my sophomore, like going into junior year, I went to UC Davis. Um, where like the residential program was held for um, that element of TRIO. Um, and that was like a, a very fundamental experience for me because like I worked as an intern for an assemblyman who's now like a, a, a Los Angeles city councilman oh, wow. um, named Gilbert Cedillo. And uh, yeah, like I worked in his office that whole summer. And when I got out of um, like when, when the program um, at UC Davis, met his completion. He actually put me on uh, as like an intern at his staff office in downtown Los Angeles, and I was just like 15 or like right. 16, so that was really cool. Yeah. Because um, were you set on going to college? Was that one of your main priorities at that time? Well, like I never had, like, again, like, you know, like I was a first generation college student, like my mm -hmm. family didn't have that precedent. But, like, I never imagined myself not, not going mm -hmm. to college mm -hmm. or, like, mm -hmm. not going to college. Right, right. Um, what it opened up for me was, like, actually – so I guess what TRIO did was make it a possibility rather than just a thought. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, like, they put you on campus. Yeah, they put me like, on campuses. Yeah. Like, I met people that have gone to college mm -hmm. or, like, were currently students or whatever, and that was a big thing for me because, like, I don't know anybody that went to college. Um all of, like, the little things, like, details that um, other, I don't know, like, non-TRIO students weren't fortunate enough to have, for example, like, uh, getting your applications waived, mm -hmm. um, getting your, like, SAT waived and, like, having SAT prep, mm -hmm. um, like, all the tutoring things and just, like, the general accountability of it all, like, you would have to check in every week, which just seems overbearing, you know, when you're a high schooler or whatever. But when you're outside of 
um, that period of your life, you're like, oh, I really needed that Mm because, like, I wasn't going to check in either way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So I guess what Trio did was just make a thought a reality. Obviously, it's, like, hard work on both both sides. Like, there's so much going on now as an adult. Like, I think about how much work went behind my program, Mm -hmm. Um, but, like, from the directors, from the tutors and all of that. Like, that's a lot of man hours um, to be doing stuff. And, like, they're not getting paid that much. Right. So I think about that as an adult. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, because I always sometimes explain my job as a personal assistant. Yeah. You it, know, it really to, is sort of like that yeah. to the students. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like, I think back to, like, um, it's been 15-plus years, so, like, I can't remember everyone's name. Mm-hmm. But I still remember the director's name of our program, and his name was uh, Jim Harrison. Mm-hmm. And, I don't know, like, uh, he set us up for a lot of success. And I know he worked that program for 15 years wow, or something yeah. before he moved on for, like, some sort of professorship. Mm-hmm. But, I don't know, like, he had a major impact in my life. Um, and, like, one that I'm still reaping the benefits from now and will continue to do so, like, until I'm dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, that's amazing, too, for the program to have connections with assembly, you know, yeah. men and people in that. Um, we were fortunate enough to have, yeah. like, a good connection with UC Davis. And, yeah. like, UC Davis is right next to Sacramento. Mm-hmm. So, like, um, Look at the, there was a nice inroad. That's where the for capital that. is yeah. <laughs> for, for, for geography people. Yeah. So, like, Sacramento is like California's Raleigh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, yep. Yeah. Well, that's good. And then um, where did you end up going to undergrad? So I ended up going to UC Santa Barbara. Um, Which is gorgeous. It is. It it is absolutely gorgeous. (laughs) It's like horrifically gorgeous. Um, I've been all over the world and I think Santa Barbara might be the most beautiful place um, that I've ever been. And I was fortunate enough to live there for uh, six years. Oh, wow. And, uh, like, the reason it was six years was because it's so beautiful and because it was so incredibly different from Los Angeles, like my part of Los Angeles, which was only 110 miles away or whatever. It's, like, it might as well be on the moon. Mm-hmm. Um, I ended up dropping out when I was a sophomore uh, when I was 19, and I was out for two years. Mm-hmm. Um because it was overwhelming. Like, mm-hmm. I um, didn't set the right priorities. Um, I didn't know who to go to. I didn't talk to people. Mm-hmm. Like, I just did all, like, the things that you're not supposed to. Um, Why do you think you did that? It was a mixture of just uh, not knowing any better. Like, mm-hmm. I'm saying that now. Mm-hmm. But just ignorance. Like, right. Um Like, maybe to a degree willful ignorance on some parts, but other parts were just, like, truly ignorance. Like, I didn't know any better. Right. Um, So, like, even with the support of Upper Bound and Trio up until that point, because you're, like, like, uh, the one that I was in, like, it ends at high school. Mm -hmm. And then, like, you're just um, in the system. And I think there was, like, this other program called EOP Mm -hmm. um, at UC Santa Barbara, but it was, like, much, much less, like, hands-on. Right. And it's, it was just, like, you know, like, like more social and, mm-hmm. like, tutoring-type stuff mm-hmm. than, like, the holistic right. sort of um, all-encompassing type of situation that Upward Bound is. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like, there's just, like, the common problems, just ignorance, um, dumb decisions, money. Like, mm-hmm. money was a big issue because, like, you're just trying to support yourself or, like, make your financial aid stretch as much as you can. But, like... At a really rich school like UC Santa Barbara, was just, like, hard uh, right. to do those things. Yeah, because it's totally different functioning in different communities. Mm-hmm. And so then how you function and succeed in one community and then you go to – and what you're saying is, like, extremes. Yeah, like so – Santa, you know, and so it's like – So I, I guess, like, to give you, like, a, a better perspective of what I'm talking about mm-hmm. – so the high school I went to, I went to Mountain View High School in the city called El Monte, California. And my school was, I think, 20, 2,500 people. And of that 2,500 people, there were three white people and, like, f- two black people. 
and the rest it was Mexican, <laughs> like not El Salvadorian, like not Nicaraguan, just Mexican. Mexican. <laughs> and then like the other ten percent, like there's like the other ten yeah. percent on that, and that's Asian. Mm -hmm. um, and so I went to UC Santa Barbara, which is eighty five percent white, and it's like wealthy white. Mm -hmm. um, and like it's just a totally different universe. It's like LA is like the city and like Santa Barbara is like the rich beach. Right. You know, so it was right. just totally different. Yeah, because I mean, that's what a lot of research says is that when you, what made you successful in that home environment doesn't necessarily translate to make no. you successful yeah. in another environment. And so you do have to learn like a different language, like a different mm -hmm. set of, it's, what they call it's like hidden rules. Yeah. There was things probably you just didn't know you were supposed to do. Yeah, just little things. But it wasn't necessarily ignorance. I mean, it was ignorance, but it was just like, yeah, because you'd never experienced it yeah. before. And how many people had you met from Santa Barbara mm -hmm. who said, hey, Jesse, let me yeah, show let me you. you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how it works. And it, it goes know? from just like like little things. Like, again, like I'm, I'm a first generation person. Mm -hmm. My dad's from Mexico. Like um, until I went to college, like I never seen a coffee table. Mm -hmm. Like I yeah. never... Uh, Ate an artichoke, like yeah, things like yeah. that that just popped up in college. So, mm -hmm. like, imagine, like, I remember I was like at a at my then college girlfriend's like family's house for dinner, and an artichoke came out, and I tried to eat the artichoke like the full leaf, oh. <laughs> and it was like super embarrassing. And she's like, yeah. "What are you doing?" And I was yeah. just like, "What? Are, like, I'm just trying to eat this artichoke." <laughs> yeah, like. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. there's little th details like that, but um, it's just in such a way when, like, it all is compounded that it was really overwhelming. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's the thing is when you're like, oh, I don't even know how to eat food. Yeah. You like, know, and so oh, it's like, what goodness. else do I, yeah, yeah, know not how to eat. Yeah. Or, yeah, what other kind of, like, that anxiety pops up. So it's not your fault. Yeah, it's just how things are. Yeah, yeah. So then what did you do when you took a break? I, uh, <laughs> it was a, a very, um, sort of like roller coaster of experiences. Yeah. Like, you, I, do you think you should have taken a break? I, like in hindsight? In hindsight, or... like, you know, um, it opened up a lot of avenues of experience for me. Um, and what I did wrong, like this wasn't a planned break. Like mm -hmm. I just dropped out, like I failed out. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't have done that in retrospect. Like I would have completed a semester mm -hmm. and had, you know, decent grades because that dropout, like getting zeros across, mm -hmm. like permanently affected my GPA and like the repercussions lasted like a decade, you right. know, like um, of trying to get into graduate school or something like that. So, like, no, like, if I would do it again, like, I wouldn't mm -hmm. do it how I did it. But the experiences that I got, like, I ended up living in Canada for, like, I don't know, almost a year, um, working all kinds of different jobs. And a lot of those jobs ended up just being, like, terrible uh, physical labor, like, grind jobs, like, cutting down trees uh, in Canada for Christmas <laughs> or, like, <laughs> yeah. digging ditches or, like, putting an installation for rich people's houses. Mm -hmm. um, so while all that stuff was going on, I was just like, man, I really should have just stayed in it's school. school. Um, so I guess, like, it was positive in that sense, too, mm -hmm. of reinforcing um, my commitment to education mm -hmm. when I got out of that situation. Mm -hmm. So luckily enough, um, I was able to rematriculate, like, two mm -hmm. years later, and I did well that second mm -hmm my second chance yeah so now i mean what would your advice be to students who are coming to nc state and in culture shock yeah. you know they're um coming either from rural counties or school like they're coming into social situations even that don't match what they're used to you know yeah, from sure. high school or whatever so how do they navigate that like experience that because you can't stop from you know, being in a totally different yeah, environment, absolutely. but so that it doesn't affect their academics or permanently affect, yeah. you know. Um, I guess my biggest suggestion would just be to talk to people. Um, and that would be your peers, your professors, like any support system that you might have, the people at TRIO. Um, like you don't, people, people, like even if people want to help you, like they're not mind readers. So you would, you have to like let that be known. Um, that you might, you're struggling. And I guess, you know, like you don't have to go into all the details with 
that particular person that you're seeking aid from. Um, but just know that you're not alone, you know? Um, I know I didn't take my own advice 10 years ago or 12 years ago or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just like put everything on my shoulders and it was too much. And they ended up folding and dropping out. And like the road back from that was way harder than, you know, just staying in and seeking help at that position, Mm -hmm. not after the fact. Right. So I guess like as soon as there's like a real struggle, like you need to let people know. Yeah. Um, and I know like your par- maybe your first generation, like your parents can only help you so much in this effect, but just, you know, putting it out there because um, I internalized all of that. Like I didn't tell my parents I was having trouble um, when I was, but um, yeah, like seek the help of your peers, like uh, – yeah, because like People isolation, yeah, yeah, is maybe the worst thing yeah. you can do where it seems like the safest yeah. thing, you know, but actually now that's the thing of, I mean, because that's what I was saying too is about your transition is, yeah, you're 18 and you were successful to get there, you know, working with people in politics, mm-hmm. you know, going to different universities, but you're 18, you're in a totally different environment. Yeah. You've never done any of this stuff before. You've never really had um, significant um, experiences in that environment, in that culture. So why would you think, you, you know, you weren't going to have problems? Yeah. I mean, that's where it's like sometimes with students, I'm like, of course you don't know what to do. Yeah. You know, and it's like, why would you know, you know, what to do? You don't what know to any do. better. Like, you, there's no point mm-hmm. of reference for any of this. Mm-hmm. It doesn't um, say anything about you. Like, there's nothing you could have done differently. Yeah. Do you think? I mean, in preparation? For it's- Again, like, a, I would, the only thing that I could have done differently was take my advice and like mm-hmm. seek help mm-hmm. when I, when I was feeling overwhelmed. Um, but, but that's again, in retrospect, like mm-hmm. I was just trying to play the strong man. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Vulnerability. And, and like is... That didn't work out. Yeah. So when have you asked for help since then? Um, well. All the time. I, I, do, <laughs> I do it all. I learned my lesson pretty strong on that one. Um, so for example, like I just, uh, I don't know if this was being recorded earlier, but I, recently accepted a job at Arizona State University and um, every part of that application process, um, getting prepped for the interview and even writing uh, like a rebuttal letter requesting more money was all using help. Like I uh, enlisted the help of my colleagues and like my peers at every step of that. Um, So like for example, I wrote my cover letter and I had my supervisor look at it and then like a couple other people look at it, too. And so here you have a graduate degree. Yeah. You're working in one of the most prestigious fellowship programs there are in library science and you're still asking for help. Yeah. And I'm oh, going to yeah. do this at every point yeah. of my career. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. So like I, you know, like she looked at my tore it up. Uh, <laughs> I had to do a presentation for this interview, like an hour long presentation. So I worked with like a whole team of people of uh, teaching librarians and like our upper administration folk in preparation of that. Um, I ran through it with them like I'd done like cold, you know, like a a cold demo with uh, another supervisor. And then like I was actually offered the job, but they lowballed me really hard and I never have been in a position in my life to like write a negotiation rebuttal type letter. Mm-hmm. So like um, I tried writing it and I was like, um, one of our senior administration, uh, our senior administrators, and like she's essentially like the head of HR mm-hmm. here. Um, yeah, like she looked at my, my, my letter and said this was terrible. <laughs> and like you need to because I was just being like super direct and like blunt like oh this wasn't going to work for me because ABC. Mm-hmm. And like I was in the Marine Corps and that's how you're taught to speak is like just you're as direct as possible like concise laconic and like just move on from that point. And then she was like this is horrific <laughs> and I, if I saw this I would just like throw it away. Um, And then she really helped me, like, reframe it in the context of an academic library professional 
Um, so it's a lot more like fluffy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like three paragraphs of just like reiteration Basically and saying fluff two and sentences. blah, 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 blah. And like the it's final like, this sentence. This is BS. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I got what I asked for after mm-hmm. that. So it was just, just this most recent process where multiple stages of me seeking help from my colleagues here at NCSU and people that I've worked with all over the place. Yeah, because why don't you think more people don't do that? I think, uh, I don't know. Um, A lot of people, even smart people, are really confident in the things that they do, so much so that they feel that they don't need the second pair of eyes and, like, more power to them if that's in the position that they're in. But I know from where I'm at right now, like, I needed that in Mm -hmm. order to get, I needed that help. Mm -hmm. Because that's the thing, too, is um, I think sometimes it's the fear of, oh, my gosh, what if they find out I don't know what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, so you showed that letter to the, you know, your colleague, Mm -hmm. the rebuttal letter. She was like, oh, my gosh, you can't send this. But that didn't make you, that didn't hurt your professional relationship with her. And I think, like, that's... um... I'm taking advantage of being like an early career professional, essentially. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of the upper division people, like they know, like you're not going to be perfect Mm -hmm. from the get go. Um, So, yeah, like it's not it's not uh, negative ignorance or like like plain dumb or whatever that you're doing. Like it's you're honestly seeking someone who knows more than you aid. And it's usually like a, a. it's it's almost like a, a cloaked. What's the word I'm looking for? You are c- like celebrating almost, or like uh, vindicating. Yeah, it's like an act of respect. Uh, like an act of respect. Yeah, like yeah. you're when you're seeking um, this particular piece of knowledge from this mm-hmm. person that you feel can help you with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, like I I think uh, when I ask people for help, like one they didn't look down on me for it, and two I think it made them feel good that. Um, someone, like, takes their ideas mm-hmm. seriously. Yeah, because, I mean, that's the number one thing I hear for students and how they pick their majors is, like, they want to be helpful, mm-hmm. you know, for whatever that medical, engineering, veterinary, whatever. And so it's, like, a, everybody, you know, wants to be helpful. Yeah. And so you're just allowing <laughs> that you're doing them a favor. Yeah, especially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, what is this with your rebuttal letter? Like, how did you? I'm, this is actually the first time I've ever heard of that. Oh, so, so what's that whole? No, like, so they uh, they gave me an offer. Um, it was less than I was hoping. It was like mm-hmm. essentially what I make now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, oh, I have to think about it. Yeah. Um, so then I wrote like a counter offer letter, mm-hmm. essentially like saying that. For these reasons, like X, Y, Z, I feel as though I I should be compensated like this much more. Right. Um, And again, like my original framing of it was super direct and like just all numbers and like me, me, me. Yeah. Um, And like when Wendy looked at it and edited it and like gave me direction on it, it was... uh, super polite (laughs) and more of like reiterating just why they want me Mm -hmm. like because i have like um i'm a great fit for this position still like i'm really excited if you were um willing to you know continue this conversation by showing more flexibility on your price range blah 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 blah. um that's better than give me more money yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah no i get i mean that's in wording is yeah the word is everything it's literally (laughs) i asked for exactly the same thing in both letters, one <laughs> I was laughed out yeah. of Google Docs. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, the second one, like I got like a twelve thousand dollar bump. Wow! So it was yeah. Um, again, like seeking help. Yeah, is also mon- monetarily yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, helpful. You know? Right, right. Yeah, there's a direct like response yeah. to that mm-hmm. and because i know a lot of people feel uncomfortable in negotiating salary yeah like i it's not that mm-hmm. i felt un- uncomfortable mm-hmm. it was just like i had no experience right like i I was every salary i had was like an hourly job until this one. Oh, i take that back and then i the other one was the marine corps 
and like there's no salary negotiation. <laughs> yeah. What no would they salary. have done to, to that ladder? Right? Like, <laughs> put it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, and I think that's a huge thing of, of knowing what you're worth. Yeah. And, and like just not lesson. immediately saying yes, even though like mm-hmm. a lot of people. So I think because library jobs are, uh, especially academic library jobs, are s- such an incredibly like horrific process to get. Mm-hmm. Like it's like six months, you know. Like you, right. Um, and like the a interview, six month process from like actually submitting an application and act, and then being given an offer letter. Yeah, it yeah. takes forever and ever because there's so many layers. Mm-hmm. Um, that the, I think the the people that hire are so used to people immediately accepting mm-hmm. the offers. That, like the person that I was talking to was a little like taken aback that I even said no to begin with. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. um, so again, like it's a, a lesson of of knowing your value and like not immediately capitulating. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm in I'm in a pretty good situation. It's like there's times that you do have to take that. <laughs> you do have to take that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, um, but yeah. I knew, like, in this particular situation, I was worth more right. in that moment. Right, right. No good. Yeah, because I think some people are, um, one, they have no experience mm-hmm. in doing that. Or two, the consequence of them saying, okay, thanks, see you is later. Goodbye. Right, yeah. is too severe. Yeah. But, so yeah. I, I took a gamble, you mm-hmm. know, but, like, it paid off. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, because especially if you're going to not want to be there yeah. because they're cheapskating you, yeah. you know. So, no, good for you. That's um, that's good. We may have you then help other students with <laughs> rebuttal letters. Well, I think I'm, I, 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 uh, I have the graduate degree and I have two years of experience on the job. It's a different game. Like, <laughs> I couldn't get a job. I graduated from my undergrad in 2008, which was the worst time to ever graduate since mm-hmm. literally the Great Depression. Um, and I couldn't get a job with that degree and all that debt all my work experience as a hot dog vendor. Mm. Like, I'm not kidding. It was just a, an atrocious time. So there are, there are times, like, just, you know. Just the fact uh, just of being employed. Yeah. yeah. Like, you, need, you need a job, but yeah. this wasn't one of them. Like, I already had a good job. That would continue on till you know, like seven months down the road or whatever. Right. Um, and I wasn't in a position to do that. If if it was back in two thousand eight, I would just say yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it already, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Because what? How did you end up getting out of that then? I ended like, up in the Marine Corps. Oh, okay. Yeah, like I couldn't find work for two years, essentially, like not any sort of decent work. All I had was my undergraduate degree, and um, I didn't do any like good internships or anything. I just took jobs in order to support myself yeah. in college. So, um. I was like a bartender or a caterer, um, worked a lot of hospitality and service type Mm -hmm. jobs Mm -hmm. when, you know, like the more better off peers were taking internships at like places that weren't paying them. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And that's huge. One of the economic barriers is, you know, of actually you don't have the option of taking an unpaid internship. And so looking back or even now, it's like, how do you... How should students manage that of that balance of you need to pay rent, but then you also need to invest in your future career? So, again, like, like I'm only going to talk about um, how it worked out for me. Yeah. And it's mm-hmm. it's not going to work out for everyone. Mm-hmm. But I was so fortunate enough in graduate school to get a graduate fellowship. Um, and this fellowship took care of all of my tuition and I was getting, uh, I think, 20 hours, like I was a half-time employee with full health benefits mm-hmm. um, at Wayne State University when I was doing my um, MLIS, my Master's mm-hmm. of Library and in Information Science. So just I know like it's not the same thing um, for undergraduates, but when you're looking at graduate schools, look at fellowships, mm-hmm. um, they're, they're competitive, but like if you get them – it helps you out so much because you get work experience, you get paid, you get insurance. Um, there's a level of security. There's a level of security. Like your sure. rent is paid. Base. Your tuition is paid. Or tuition yeah. paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
but like I was getting paid way more than like the average student worker. I was like, I think I was making like $22 an hour or something mm -hmm, as a GSA. Mm -hmm. Um, and I like totally wouldn't have been able to pursue all the different things that I did. I've done in libraries. Like if I didn't have that support. So mm -hmm. I recognize that and I'm super thankful for that. Um, so I guess it's kind of like how I equalize to people with better opportunity, like a better foundation than me. Mm -hmm. Um, was through that mm -hmm. assistantship. Now, how did you come upon your career choice? Um, so like I said, I was in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. um, I did one enlistment and you know your end date five years from, you know, like the day you get in, you know when you're getting out. Mm -hmm. And I knew about like a year out, two years out that I wasn't gonna stay in. Like it's a hard job being a Marine. And I was Marine intelligence. So I worked with a lot of information and data and I wanted to do something sort of in line with that, but without all of the weight of civil defense um, and, you know, like the military and the government, the government and all yeah. of that. So I was like, what can I do that would like have me work with information sort of that would be super chill um, and I can make at least like a middle. Uh, like being kind of like comfortable, yeah, like you a, know, like, like, a, like a comfortable type a life. A comfortable work environment. Yeah. Comfortable um, personal so life. Yeah. I decided upon libraries because I remember I had a decent job um, as like a library page or like a library student worker when I was at UC Santa Barbara. And I was like, man, these guys live a pretty good life. <laughs> Just chilling there in yeah, the stacks. Yeah, it's like a pretty, pretty all right. Like, <laughs> Like you get paid all right, no one yells at you. Like you, you work, you work on a college campus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I worked in the library in college, and I loved it. Yeah, it's like a great quality of mm -hmm. life. Like I, um, like I'm not selling profession short. Um, you know, like there are challenges to it, and like you do work, but mm -hmm. especially in in the world of academic libraries, it's just a great job um, with a very high quality of life. Mm -hmm. Um, well, because libraries aren't a traditional library anymore. No, there's like so much fun stuff going on. Mm -hmm. People get to um, have like pet passion projects that like mm -hmm. have big impacts on mm -hmm. people eventually. Um, yeah, because I saw that the horror film, yeah. like the film series. I mean, so that's the thing is like, why would there? Why would a library host, you know, a yeah. horror film event? Most people don't think that, you know. Yeah. So like. Or, um, I, I came up with this idea to have uh, this thing called Halloween Horror Fest here at DHL Library. Um, and my reasoning behind it was like, I just wanted people to come into the light or like the students, not people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like like students are all we care, are all I care about. Like I don't, I don't really work with researchers or anything. Right. Um, or professors. Um, was to find like a, a means to get students to like learn more about the library and like the stuff that we offer. Mm -hmm. Um. And I really like horror films just personally. And I had enough uh, autonomy and leeway here that I was able to come up with a, a programming platform of um, three film screenings of made in North Carolina horror films. Um, and each of those had like a workshop, like a hands-on workshop attached. And two of them of those workshops were like taught by library faculty. Um, actually, one was a student mm. too, which was pretty cool. Uh, and the third one was we hired a special effects makeup artist to come and do like a hands-on work like makeup workshop demo oh wow yeah it was really cool um so i think it was a big success yeah. like all of the films were packed yeah um the first one like i couldn't even sit down in wow. which was yeah, great yeah, yeah, yeah. um because how do you think students should view the library i mean because when i before i went to college um, I got some bad advice and I yeah, got some sure. good advice. But I remember somebody saying, like, you, the reference librarian needs to be your best friend. Yeah. Like, if you need to bring them cookies each week, like, they will save you. Yeah. So there's so. And I don't hear that a lot like, where people talk about. Yeah, like times, delivery. like, I, I get it. Like, times change totally. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of students uh, can get by just like using Google or whatever. But that's it. Like, they're just getting by. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of library, like, a whole, a librarians are trained um, for research and, like, not only utilizing Google, but, like, a lot of other uh, resources 
um, mm-hmm. and databases. Yeah, because my thing is like, why search for, you know, six hours and then your instructor not approve your sources mm-hmm. yeah, sure. <laughs> when you can go to somebody and they show you what to use so, in so an I, hour? I guess like um, my, my best pitch, like my pitch to people mm-hmm. for my pitch to students to use a library is essentially two things. It saves you time and it saves you money. So like it saves you time, like if you're having trouble finding something, um, you need sources for whatever paper you're doing. You could spend X amount of hours, you know, doing it yourself mm-hmm. and you know, not come up with what you need. Or you could spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes just talking to a librarian and learning the process and getting some resources that are good for you. Mm-hmm. And then it saves you money because all of this, we have like a huge tech lending program. Um, we lend out. We have a huge uh, course reserves program, and that means that uh, every single textbook for every single undergraduate class is in our course reserve, and it's totally free mm-hmm, for students. Mm-hmm. Um, now, do you anyth- know anything about the alt textbook Yeah, I have, I have um, a little bit of information on that. So mm-hmm. the alt textbook program is essentially like the library's push um, onto the greater campus community to make professors switch from like super expensive textbooks that are purchased from outside sources to creating like their own um, freely accessible textbook resources. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, So librarians are advocates. Yeah, we're absolutely advocates for um, the the free exchange Mm -hmm, of information. mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I mean, that's the thing is for this podcast, we've only used... Um, technology, um, even um, like guidance, like the intellectual resource mm-hmm. of library staff and library resources. So it means, I mean, a student can have their own podcast. Like there was yeah, nothing that's... you guys that's, do whatever. Yeah, and, and you have, have professional all of people. The, the resources to mm-hmm. aid you mm-hmm. in that, like not only the physical technology, but um, the personal expertise of our staff. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know, like we're in the digital media lab right now. This area is sort of the brainchild of one of our librarians. His name is uh, Jason Evans Growth. And before he was a librarian, he was a traveling musician. Yeah. Like for 20 years of his life. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so and so I like, think that's the thing is like the expertise of the people working yeah, here. Yeah, it's the expertise. Like there's, I always tell people like, and this job that I'm going into it's like, I really don't have any deep expertise on anything. I'm just really good at connecting people to people who do have that expertise mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, or whatever programming or like whatever. Um, and like, I think that's going to be sort of my framework for my career is mm-hmm. just trying to like uh, showcase this stuff as much as possible. Mm-hmm. 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 So um, you were thinking back to the librarians that you knew in undergrad and said... <laughs> I want that life. Yeah. And so then you were um, in the Marines, and so then you decided to leave the military. So you get yeah. separated. Like, you have yeah. a separation date. Yeah. Um, so, like, I knew, like, that date long in advance, and I started making preparations for it. Everyone's like, oh, man, like, how did you end up in Detroit, Michigan, like, being from Los Angeles, California? Yeah. And I was like, uh, in order to use the GI Bill— There's a stipulation that, like, to get your max benefit, you need a physical class. Mm -hmm. And in California, even for 36 million people, there's only two MLIS granting institutions. Mm -hmm. Which has a military, uh, military, that's a (laughs) master's in library science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, UCLA and San Jose State, and San Jose State's only online. So I didn't get into UCLA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. because of my dropout, <laughs> like, right. because of dropping out <laughs> right. and like the decisions of 10 years earlier, you mm-hmm. know, so I had to make a hard decision. It was like, oh, do I alter, you know, like, do I go for something else? Do I start working or do I have to make a big move um, in order to like get this degree? Mm-hmm. So I ended up making the big move um, and moving. I went to Wayne State University to in Detroit, Michigan to do my MLIS. Mm-hmm. Um, and what was the course work like? What was graduate school? Like? Graduate school, like after the Marine Corps, everything's super chill. <laughs> like every, every day of my life in graduate school and every day of my life in North Carolina, it's just like whatever. Like, it's great. Um, so I'm, I don't I'm know not, if this is an advertisement like, for the military <laughs> service. No, it, it should be. Like, you're, yeah. you're, like a, you, uh, 
you're trained up and like things are of such importance like um i don't know like if my work here for example like if i don't show up or um i mess up or i don't know like i don't know something mm -hmm. the repercussions are really small mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um in the military the repercussions are really big yeah <laughs> so it's uh the the pressure is a lot different mm -hmm. and like the, the work culture and just the culture itself of yeah, because I'm just academia thinking... and libraries compared to the Marine Corps yeah. is uh, another universe. Yeah. So I've yeah, you've, a... your story has been of extremes. Yeah, my you know, story so you is go of extremes. Work, you know, uh, blue collar working um, community in Los Angeles that was pretty homogeneous. Yeah. Then um, to Santa Barbara, then to the Marines. Yeah. <laughs> then to you Michigan, know, to, right now in the South. Right. So, like, I'm I'm pretty ready to get yeah. <laughs> get back west. Um, and Arizona is still not my home, mm -hmm. but it's closer. Mm -hmm. So now, how has that been leaving home? Like, not being going back to LA because I know that's a lot of expectations of families yeah. is that you then go back home. It's been hard uh, to be honest. Like, my whole life is in Los Angeles. Like, how people say they have family like all over. You know, like I have family all over the country. Or, like, I have family all over, you know, wherever. I only have family in a county. <laughs> <laughs> all my family lives in Los Angeles. Like, no one's even outside of the county borders, except, like, my dad's side, which is from Mexico. Right. Um, so are you the only one in yeah, your I'm entire little, family that left? Yeah. And, like, and that's, like, my extended family, too. Yeah. So. Um, so what's your role in the family? Like, how do they view you? It's it's kind of weird. Like I'm uh, I'm like the absentee uncle, so it's not like a position that I relish. And I'm hoping that uh, my move to Arizona is going to change that, because mm -hmm. um, I'm only going to be like four and a half hours away from my right. home driving. But um, yeah, I think that's like you know like it's been the hardest part of this all has just been being away from my family and being away from my state and my city because I don't know like I. Uh, just like a lot of kids, I think, you know, like that are coming from rural communities here in North Carolina, like they don't know any different than right. that rural community. Mm -hmm. Up until I left the Marine Corps or I left for the Marine Corps, all I knew was Southern California. Mm -hmm. Like my parents never took me anywhere. I never went on vacation anywhere. So to know how different the rest of the world is <laughs> from Southern California, like has just weighed on me mm -hmm. um, for the last, you know, seven years, like things that I just always assumed everyone felt the same way and it's just like an ingrained like just i don't know like uh you don't question like the general consensus right of your society that you live in mm -hmm. and then like coming to places like north carolina where it's mm -hmm. a lot a lot different um than southern california yeah, I mean, there's a lot of places that are a lot different than well, like, Southern yeah. California. Well, it's just yeah, like yeah, the yeah. whole, like, you realize, yeah. uh, like, you, I don't know, like, being, being a Californian and, like, only living in California, um, you're in a bubble. Like, mm -hmm. you're in an island. Mm -hmm. And, like, you, like, like, again, like, this idea of ignorance comes into play because you're ignorant mm -hmm. of the rest of the world. Like, you're mm -hmm. ignorant of weather. Mm -hmm. And, like, yeah. you're ignorant, like, of, I don't know, a lot of... The I'm, racial tensions yeah. that are a lot stronger in other places. Um, it's just different. Yeah. So I am looking forward to going back west. But again, like I'm going to a different animal again because Arizona, uh, I think, has a lot a lot of things in line with North Carolina that I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's going to be different again from like a native Californian mm -hmm. and like uh, mm -hmm. sort of like our you know, blanket beliefs. Right, right. And, you know, you may need to be there. Yeah. You know, there may be people there who need you to yeah, be there. Sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now, are you glad that you left Los Angeles or California? Do you wish you had stayed? Because I know a lot of people, mm -hmm. a lot, some of the students I am uh, work with don't have, like, they don't look at graduate schools outside of North yeah. Carolina. You know, they, but so, is there a benefit oh, yeah, to leaving? There's a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, like, that's like the question of my life. Like, was it worth it? <laughs> like, I always, <laughs> I ask myself that all the time because it's two divergent paths that I, like, went on. Um, like, this one is, like, career focused. Like, I'm building up experience um, at all these other places. But at the cost of like being part of a community 
mm-hmm. um, at the cost of like being away from my family. Um, so that's been hard. But like I wouldn't, I absolutely wouldn't have had the same career opportunities if I stayed in California. Mm-hmm. Like that's 100% true, um, at least for me and the profession that I'm in. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess like my my big goal, like again, because everything has had like in my life has to have been generated, like it's self made, like I, nothing was given. Hopefully, maybe after this job, I can have enough experience to get like a really good job back in California. Mm-hmm. So I guess it's like the the long goals, right? That, um, are driving me because you're going to live to ninety, a hundred, yeah, you know, know probably one hundred and ten. Yeah, and I'm going to be working till one hundred and ten. That's the society we live in now. Yeah, but I mean, that's the thing is like that short payoff. Yeah. To then getting like the good or even a job of choice yeah, you know no, you absolutely. can choose mm-hmm. and like i as i'm as my career is progressing um that's just becoming more apparent like i i declined offers you mm-hmm. know like i can i have that ability mm-hmm. um so there's definitely my like the sacrifices that i made to go out away from home um in the end are giving me self-determination mm-hmm. that i wouldn't have had if i stayed mm-hmm so yeah like i guess you know like i'm living a better life like my quality of life in north carolina is much higher than my quality of life in southern california i i can tell you that but, right like, right just economically yeah just like economically um mm-hmm. traffic yeah it's just different <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah and i so i mean i guess that's a message too is is that the pain you know physical pain emotional yeah. pain it actually like there it, it can be worth it yeah so how do you tell the difference between like what was what's a good sacrifice and what's a sacrifice that you know won't lead to anything mm-hmm. or how do you know the difference it's tough like to hardship s- yeah uh that's a, that's a really hard thing to pinpoint mm-hmm. and like and not to do it only in retrospect mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um I don't know. So, like, for example, like this Arizona State job, it's like I'm really excited about it. But Arizona wasn't my first choice. Mm-hmm. But this position that, like, is being offered to me, like where I land in the organization and, like, the work that I'm going to be doing and the amount of people that I'm going to be over mm-hmm. is only, again, going to, like, set me up for more self-determination. Right. Um. So, like, I don't know. Like, uh. I guess it's a case by case right. basis, mm-hmm. and like the story's only happy if it works out. You know? <laughs> right, 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 right. Well, I guess it's the thing is like you know when to bail. Yeah. You know when there is no benefit. Like you can't see. Oh yeah, the there's benefit. like yeah, there's sometimes that you just have to walk away from things for sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now the thing that we had, which you and I had mentioned before, um, we even started recording was that with library science, it's. Um, Again, a, like a different culture mm-hmm. because the majority of librarians are, I think I looked it up and it's like they actually have the average age is 49 yeah. white women. It's just, it's an, it's an older profession full of white people. Full and of white you're women. not a 49 year old white so woman. I'm not, I'm not a 49 year old <laughs> white woman. So, I mean, what does that feel like when you go, um, because you've talked about it, you know, of like the transition from high school to college, you know, kind of like not being in the majority. Mm -hmm. Um, So what does that feel like to be in a career where you're always going to be? It's weird. Like it's not, um, I have to separate my private self from my work self pretty strongly in this profession, Um, just on little things, especially like. I came from, like, the most hyper-masculine Marine Corps culture where, mm-hmm. like, everything's curse, like, everything's vulgar, everything's sports. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just, uh, you know, like, fun with your buddies. Um, you know, maybe not, like, the best environment for everyone, but for mm-hmm. the people that are, like, in that culture, like, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, to one that is literally the exact opposite (laughs) so every like it's always sort of like walking on eggshells like especially when i first got out i had to always think about the words that were coming out of my mouth Mm -hmm. um and like everything's filtered even at this point still um one of the most frustrating things about working in such a white environment or like white culture profession or whatever and in academia too is i feel like everything is just always like you're you can never be direct with people 
and everyone gets offended if there's any sort of directness. And that's hard for me. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm a very direct person. And the idea of always having to fluff and, like, buffer things. To to make sure the other person's okay. To make sure the other person's okay. And even if, like, um, yeah, like, I don't know. Is it, yeah. um, Yeah, just, just like, this idea of, like, constantly buffering everything is really tiring. Like you're translating it. Lately. Yeah, like I'm translating like mm-hmm. how I'm like how I would like talk to my friend or my buddy. Right. And then there has to be like a filter. Right. To how, like how I would talk to a colleague mm-hmm. here, mm-hmm. Um, for the most part. Um, and I'm sure you see it when people don't or students. You yeah. know, like interacting with students where you want to say like, "Oh, could you tone that?" You know, it'll just help you out a lot mm-hmm. better. You know, with the person with the letter for you, yeah. or the rebuttal letter. It's like, if you just did these things, it's going to work out better yeah. for you. Like, I'm not changing you as a person. I'm just saying, if no, you want more money, like, then you like, need to say it this way. Or it's it's a trade off. Mm-hmm. So like, I have this good job. Um, you know, like I work in a university. I'm using my master's degree, all of those things. But, you know, like the trade off is I'm in the system. Like mm-hmm. I, I it's uh like I'm part of this culture now. Um and like no matter what I do or how hard I try to um I don't know, like be individualistic or whatever. Or authentic. Or like authentic, like there has mm-hmm. to be buffer or I'm gonna get like out it. You know, mm-hmm. like, or like, it, this is not going to like work out for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you think you're bringing something to like change that from being so narrow? Um, I, or it's, so strict? It's tough or? because like it's uh, because it's such like a traditional uh, culture. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you don't want to rock the boat mm-hmm. at all for anything. And even if like all of the rhetoric that the university espouses is like. Oh, diversity this and blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like a lot of times, like you have to know when words are just words. And like, right. even if that's painful or even if it like goes against what the surface words say. Yeah. Like, um, so how I feel about this, it's it's a numbers game Like mm-hmm. with professions like this. Like mm-hmm. these well-paying, like nice professions mm-hmm. are overwhelmingly white. Um, so like where I stand in it, like I'm I'm starting to weigh the numbers game. Mm-hmm. Like. There's one of me mm-hmm. in there. Maybe there'll be two. And, maybe, mm-hmm. and, you know, maybe five years down the road, there'll be three. Mm-hmm. So just like my presence alone and not being like, I need to go get another degree and like right. find a new job kind of situation. Um, well, I think it's too, it's, you know, the what you were saying is, you know, kind of like the payoff of the lifestyle, the pay. You like the information mm-hmm. piece. You like working with students. And then the like the environment, but it's not just an office environment. It's also the campus environment. Mm-hmm. It's also, you know, our society. Yeah. Um, and so when is it worth it to change a profession, you know, yeah. or because it's to get something that's not as... Like homogeneous, you know, like not yeah. and not as um, clutching mm-hmm. to that, like wanting to keep that. Or how long would it take for librarians to yeah, be that's diverse? What I, that's what I, was, I was thinking about, like, <laughs> yeah. too. Um, it's like, oh, man, like uh, what would happen is like, you know, like I would get another degree and like I'll do the whole thing, start from the bottom again. Mm-hmm. But it could be the same exact thing. Mm-hmm. You know, like mm-hmm. it would be the same thing with just different words and like different faces. So... Yeah, I'm, I think I'm pretty set on mm-hmm. this path. Right. Um, but I guess when you ask me, like, how I plan on using myself to change that, mm-hmm. uh, it's happening. Like, at Arizona, mm-hmm. like, I, I have a managerial authority. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to have people under me. Like, I'm in charge of um, their whole first-year uh, instruction program. Oh, wow. At Arizona State. And that's almost It's almost all... 80,000 people. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, with the goal of being 200,000 people by 2025. So my my job is going to be heading up um, all of the first year's interaction with the library and then, mm-hmm. um, like, th- with their, you know, initial instruction. Like So then like you're, yeah, you're in charge of the culture. Yeah, for that, mm-hmm. to a degree, mm-hmm. um, as well, much yeah, as within, I can yeah, shape Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then managing all of the circulation points. At six libraries. Um, wow. 
Yeah, it's That's a, a big lot. jump. Yeah, yeah, kind of like a really cool job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think like that's just a perfect example of like uh, playing within the system, getting a you know like a position of some authority, mm-hmm. and then trying to affect it at that point, mm-hmm. and not struggling at the bottom um, mm-hmm. against like the waves on top of you. Yeah, I mean, because how do you, you know, kind of it's like how do you like protect yourself i'm not sure of how you even view it but it's like when you're in that environment where you probably are experiencing like microaggressions Mm -hmm. but then you can't articulate it like you can't directly or can you like directly address it or is it one of those things where you are like weighing okay i understand you know like do i address this do i not it's sort of like that one's a again like the case by case yeah Mm -hmm. it's like it's tough because you're like uh, a person of color or whoever, like shouldn't have to have these decisions all the time. Mm-hmm. Like it's exhausting. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times it it benefits you more not to say something. Mm-hmm. Um, so as how- like negative as that sounds, or like right, against right. popular belief that sounds. But how do you take care of yourself? Like because ex- burnout is real. Yeah, I mean, for it- sure. Um, the the psychic burnout you know the psychic exhaustion the emotional yeah. exhaustion again like i i think i've been fortunate enough in my past uh through my time in the marine corps to put everything mm-hmm. into perspective mm-hmm. in the sense that like um i have a very good ability to let things go yeah and like wa- like just wash over me yeah um, obviously, you know, if there was like some transgression that was too big to ignore, I would call it out immediately. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, like if it was like some racist apathet or, you know, um, something really blatant, but like the tiny little like microaggression things for the most part, I just try to ignore, right. um, you know, like, and a lot of times like, or the nature of those for the most part, like if you're trying to look at, um, give people the benefit of the doubt. Like they're unintentional, mm-hmm. you know. So like that's another element to that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and that's even exhausting because then you have to explain. Yeah. <laughs> to, like educate, yeah. you know, um, that too. Yeah, for sure. But it, so I, I guess that's like your advice to the students when they, you know, you are exhausted. It's, you know, just kind of like pick and chew. You got to let like practice letting yeah. that, just letting go of that. All, like you have, you have to learn that absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, just the ability to let things go. Like that's mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe that might be the number one thing as a human <laughs> that you have to do is like be good. Yeah. Like don't try to harm people, and then you have to like let things go. Right. Um. So I don't know. Like I've gotten pretty good at letting things go with all of my my moves, and I don't know mm-hmm. these big dramatic uh, jumps in my life. It's just I don't know uh, a story about letting go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you've gone everywhere and done everything yeah. I mean, <laughs> in all the extremes. This will probably be the first time in your life where you've gone from one similar situation to another. Sim- you know, you're going from a university library to another yeah. university library. Yeah, it's it's uh, the geography. The geography is going to be a lot different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. Um, is there anything else you want to leave the students with or you think it's important for them to know? Um, Mm -hmm. I think about like all the different reasons I didn't seek help and how dumb they were. (laughs) It's just like childish and selfish and silly. Um, and you just got to get over it. Like get over yourself, like get over all of that. Like you're not perfect. You're never going to be, um, seek help when you need to. And it's really great for students because they're at like an age right now where everyone wants to help them. Mm -hmm. Like this is the time to be helped like as you get older like people don't want to help you as much you know mm-hmm. like and it gets worse and worse as you age too well it's the um, norm like you're supposed you're in college you're supposed to ask for help yeah. and actually as professionals it's like we almost are annoyed when students don't, don't ask have, for help yeah, absolutely like that's the biggest complaint is it, when absolutely. students don't I agree ask with for that help 100 um so yeah like that idea of just like always looking for help i hope like this conversation has instilled or you know like given you that idea and like i just said this a minute ago like letting go of things um be it you know (laughs) a bad day at work or uh you know like your roommates hassling you things aren't working out like you got a rejection letter um from a job from a school from whatever there's always tomorrow man like you 
just have to pick yourself up and keep moving on and things will eventually pan out or I hope they do for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because nothing's um, permanent. Like nothing's permanent. I think back, you know, um, like I said in this earlier in this interview, uh, I graduated college in 2008 and I couldn't find a job as a hot dog vendor. And I was like living in my parents' garage. And now I am going to Arizona State with like a master's degree to a really good job. And I'm probably going to buy a house. So it's like nothing's too permanent. You know? Yeah. So in 2008 did not define you. Yeah. Like that I, was just a blip in time. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So I guess those are like the two things that I, I hope you gathered from this is just seek help. Use a library if you need that. I'm mm-hmm. not saying like we're, you know, like an all encompassing source of uh, emotional and educational support. But we have your back for a lot of things. And if we don't, like we can we can connect you guys to the people that do, like be it counseling, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like be it whatever college you're coming from, whatever, you know, like career you're looking into. We have uh, we have great relationships with the uh, career and counseling services here. So just seek help and use it and then move on from things that don't work out. Like <laughs> just keep on going. Right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Jesse. Thank you for having me. This was fun. TRIO Student Support Services Program and Student Support Services STEM are federally funded college retention and completion programs. These programs focus on academic, personal, and career support for under-resourced undergraduate students. At TRIO SSS and SSS STEM, our goal is helping our students reach their goals. We are currently accepting new students to our program. Apply today. Go to www.ncsu.edu to learn more about Student Support Services at NC State.